Now, to a name that the corrosive forces of time haven't managed to obliterate. Namdi Azikiwe, the man they affectionately call, affectionately call Zik of Africa. Born in 1904, Zik studied in the United States by the age of 30. He'd started a political program geared towards the total emancipation of his country, Nigeria, and the African continent. His first major book, Renaissance Africa, published in 1937, turned him into one of the most prominent and widely heard political activists on the continent. A linguist, sportsman, orator, scholar, and journalist, he was, above all, a peerless statesman. In 1963, he became Independence Nigeria's first president. A great apostle of Pan-Africanism, Zik was also an ardent believer in democratic principles, the rule of law, and politics without bitterness. But while many consider what he did against colonialism to be truly heroic, others see his desertion of Biafra in the last days of the Nigerian Civil War as very uncharitable indeed. Well, for more on the legacy of Namdi Azikiwe and the Zik Lecture Series, which takes place next week, I'm joined now by Senator Ben Obi, who came up with the initiative some 10 years ago. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, let's start with Zik's place in history. Um, a man with a Pan-African vision who was a nation builder, the first president of Nigeria, but also someone who's seen by some as having betrayed his own people in support of what he saw as a greater cause. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Charles, and uh, good afternoon, Nigerians. Uh, talking about Zik of Africa and his uh, legacies, one cannot but say without any fear of contradiction that he indeed was a great African statesman. And he did everything within his powers, took other African leaders with him in search of green pastures. Mm. And most of them came back and led their countries. Most of them, Kenya, Tanzania, you can name them, Ghana, all of them were people that went with Zeke. And that was why he was named Zeke of Africa. Now, Coming to the issue of uh, before the war ended, don't forget, the full recognition we got was all gotten by him. Through him, we got the recognition in Biafra. Now, when things started going the way he saw them, unfortunately, he felt, look, I must unite Nigeria once again. And that was what led him back into Nigeria. But well, what, what made him go the, I mean, you've just mentioned that he drove the, he, the, the, you know, the moves towards recognizing Biafra. What then made him change his mind in the middle of all of that? Uh, there was some misunderstanding, to the best of my knowledge. There was some misunderstanding. And you recall that, I mean, I also had a very, very strong relationship with Dean uh, Chukwe Mekad Megujuku. Mm. And I discussed this severally with him. You know, uh, he said to me that Zeke said to him the way he was going was not the way he thought. And that was why when he thought he, uh, General Juku was going too far, he said, no, slow it down. And then right. he saw that we were losing ground and he needed to negotiate to save his own people. That's Zeke. Then flew into Nigeria and met with General Gowan. So it wasn't him skipping to the winning side, as some people no, have suggested. No, not really. Not really. It wasn't skipping to the winning side. I mean, he knew there was danger. He saw danger ahead. Mm. And then, of course, you know that before the war ended, General Juku himself left the country. Mm. So these were all things that, you know, when you put the puzzle together, you understand why Zig did what he did. It was too close for comfort. Mm. 
But I mean, there are many who believe that Zeke, beyond you know the, the Biafra sort of um, issue, there are many who believe that he had a message that was universal, especially for our time. A time, for example, in Nigeria today, which is so riven with ethnic and sectional right. conflict. Um, because he was a man who had the capacity to understand his opponent, wasn't right. he? I mean, he, and to bring them round to negotiate settlements and to talk with them. I mean, that is surely a skill which Nigeria is in dire need of today. Absolutely. Now, you see, when you talked about emancipation of the Nigerian people and the African uh, continent, it was in fact emancipation of the black man mm. across the globe. So what Zeke was famous for was that he was able to read and study situations, and he was able to prefer solutions to them. Mm. Some may not like the approach, you know, but, but most people did. And if you look at his politics here in Nigeria, for instance, there was no part of the country that he did not establish fellowship. Absolutely. And he, he, he groomed them, and they were able to lead in their various areas. So Zeke, as a, as a person, was indeed created for special purposes and he accomplished them you know there are so many things you want to talk about the great zeke of africa you know back home back home when he wanted to establish the university of nigeria he didn't call it university of uh he called it university of nigeria mm. you know so there are these things that you look at you will know that he came ahead of his time mm. and he fought a battle not using the sword, but using the pen right. to conquer. So, I mean, he, he was, to be fair, a true nationalist. Absolutely. True nationalist and great Pan-Africanist. Mm. But then he didn't achieve that just united Nigeria that he wanted, did he? Because, I mean, six years after the independence he fought so hard for yeah. and the unity that he craved, Nigeria started having a lot of problems for five years uh, hence. Um, and today there are strong perceptions and feelings of injustice and marginalization in the southeast, aren't there? Correct. I mean, we all know about this. Uh We've been talking about it, and we've spoken. Some of us have even approached the government. Look, we want, we want a level playing field. We want also to be given our own dues in government. We have made so much sacrifice as as the South Easterners. We have made so much sacrifices in this country, in Lagos, Kano, Abuja, everywhere the Southeaster travels to. He's either holding the number one position of the economy of that area or minimum number two. And he builds the area as if he's building his home. Not even as much as he builds his home. They commit themselves more, you know. So what we are asking for is a level playing field. And you see, Zeke has become a reference point when you talk about the unity of this country. Even our brothers from the north, from the west, will always say it, that in terms of unifying this country, mm. nobody came near as close to Z. Well, I mean, he's been nominated several times to win the title of African of the Millennium. He hasn't won, but you, do, you think he's worthy of that title, Dean? I do mm. believe he's worthy of that title, and I'm sure that sometime, you know, um, he will definitely be nominated and he will be given the title. He deserves it. Well, I mean, the last time, to be fair, he came third and he was only beaten out by uh, Nelson Mandela and by Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. But, but what's it been like working on this Zik lecture series and, and how would you <coughs> describe the reaction to it? It's been marvelous. It's, you know, I, I'm <coughs> so encouraged. You know, um, this 10th anniversary, actually, we didn't do the ninth anniversary 
because of the pandemic. Mm. And that, uh, that one was to actually, the keynote speaker was uh, Dr. Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. She, I went to New York, I met with her, and she, was, she gave me an okay, but then the pandemic came and we did. So this year, I decided that, look, I have to get the Southeast governors involved. It's the 10th anniversary. And uh, all of them have keyed into it. They will all be there on Tuesday, the 16th. And uh, the keynote speaker is the chairman of the Governor's Forum, Dr. John Carrier Fire Me, who uh, the governor of Ekiti State, the keynote speaker. Now, in addition to that, because it's 10 years, I want to also lay the foundation of the ZIC, uh, um, ZIC series, lecture series, and legislative studies, which I hopefully will complete in three years maximum. Now, what I have done over time is that I've always invited former presidents and prime ministers. I've had President Rawlings, I've had Pre of Ghana, President uh, Benjamin Nkapa of Tanzania, I've had uh, Dr. Ernest Bayekoroma of Sierra Leone, I've had Prime Minister Raila Odinga, uh, Vice President Atiku Abubakar, um, Emeka Anyoku, Wole Shoinka, Asobia. I've had great right. statesmen you know, participate in this lecture. So it's, it's always a big event for mm. me, and I, I take joy in doing it every year. You know, it's, for me, it has become a passion. Well, we commend you for doing it, but please Thank stay you. with us because we want to discuss other things with you. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat with Senator Ben Erbi, former special advisor to the president of Nigeria and convener of the National Peace Committee. Stay with us. And Senator Ben Obi, member of the PDP's National Executive Council, and who was the vice presidential running mate to Atiku Abubakar in 2007, is still with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you, George. What's your reaction to your party, the PDP's loss in Anambra State? I mean, I expect it's a little more painful because you came second, even though the margin of victory and the scale of your loss was quite large. Yes. Um, well, don't forget, really, that ABGA is the incumbent government. Mm -hmm. And um, that, to me, says a lot, because ABGA, over time, has been seen as the Igbo party. So that consideration is always there. And um, the PDP, I can say for certainty, is still the largest party in the country and in Alhambra in particular. However, because of some misunderstanding, we lost some of our members to other parties, and that created some uh, uh, some kind of gap in the party. Mm. But, but I mean, if, if APGA is seen as the party of the Igbo people, why is PDP still in other states? I mean, no. obviously something went wrong in Anambra State. Oh, you know, like I said, some of our members left the party right. after the primaries, the, the Congress, and went to uh, be candidates in other parties. That's a minus, okay? But then, if you go to the ground, the PDP is very much on the ground. Every nook and cranny you visit in Alhambra, you will find the PDP there. And D2 for the country. But you see, like I said, because ABGA, being the incumbent party in government, they also had a good number of the officials. They had better grassroots reach. They were, they were reach. holding the, is local, that what government. You're saying? Right. the local government. So, but we also presented a very good, a very good candidate. Yeah, very I was, was going to say Valentine Oz was candidate. a good candidate, but, but clearly something didn't quite click with the people of Anambra State. Well, as I'm saying, you know, to kind of knock off Abga, it's not 
an easy task. Yeah, but, but be, if be, we had, if yeah. we had been together, mm. you know, as a team from the Congress, it would have been very difficult. Yeah, but, but just looking at the debate, for example, that right. took place on Arise News. I right. mean, it, it didn't have anything, nobody was talking about looking at them and thinking of incumbent government or not. They well, looked at the performance. I mean, I'm not saying that's what necessarily led to, you know, to a Saluda's victory, but certainly his performance was rated as the best in that debate. Whose performance? Saluda's performance. Well, Saluda did very well, hmm. and expectedly so. Valentine did also very, very well. I mean, you, you can, people commented on them. Their performances at the debate, excellent. But what I'm, I'm concerned about the people of Alhambra State mm. is the people of Alhambra State, you know, whose votes finally, like I said to you on the 5th, you know, when election, you are having election coming up in Alhambra State, the tension is always very, very high. But 96 hours, 72 hours to elections, it disappears. And the people become very understanding. They go cast their votes peacefully. You know, and that's what you saw on Saturday. But don't forget, Professor Chukuma Soludo has been around. He's run for the governorship before on the platform of the PDP. So he's not a new entrant at home. Mm in the politics of Alhambra State. So for him, imagine now, and that's why you saw that at least uh, immediately two days ago, uh, Val Ozibo, our candidate, congratulated him. And I also mm. congratulated him. The leader of the PDP in the state, uh, Peter B, has also done so. Yeah, because we know that he's been around. And you, uh, an Alhambrarians, it counts, it matters. You know, so or from our governor of Central Bank, mm. you know, so they know him. He's not a new face, you know. And, and are you convinced that the election was free and fair, and that it was conducted in a clean manner? Because some people in other parties have raised uh, questions and cast aspersions. Well, you cannot really have a hundred percent of free, fair, and transparent elections, but basically. Uh, apart from the some areas that had issues, mm. you know, uh, that were quite uh, worrisome, but they were taken care of uh, much later. I think, generally speaking, it was a peaceful and uh, fair election. And in any case, I mean, those places that you mentioned where no. things went didn't go very well. I no. mean, the, the, the voting uh, numbers were not enough, enough to, to dramatically upset. alter the... No. Absolutely the, the, so. the, the way things turn, you know, turned uh, out. Uh, I think um, we've had uh, that election. We think it's come and gone, and we're happy the way it turned out ultimately mm. uh, because everybody was concerned. <coughs> everybody was, people were calling from all over the country, you know, oh, are you safe? What's going on? But at least we have shown again that uh, as an embryon, yes. We care and we appreciate democracy. Yes, I, I thought it was a, it it it, uh, it went reasonably well. Yeah. I mean, much better than most other elections yeah, in, in Nigeria. I and think. Professor Saludo has said that there is enough space for everyone to work with him and to serve in his government. I mean, would the PDP be prepared to work with him in that spirit of reconciliation and transformation that he talked about? Will you accept that hand of fellowship that he is offering, the idea that Anambra is stronger together? Well, I, I have... Or is that just a sort of excited uh, speech after winning no, no, an no, eclipse? Like, like I said, uh, Professor Soldo has been around mm. for a while, so he knows what to do. I'm sure he will hit the ground running. But uh, the answer to your question, it is a decision of the party. And I cannot sit down here, saying because I'm a member of the BOT, a member of NEC, I will say yes. It's, uh, I will accept the hand of uh, friendship that he has extended on behalf of the party. It's a party decision. Mm. And if I, if I am in a meeting, we'll, we'll look at all sides to see, look, is helping going to bring more, uh, more united Anambra? Mm. And will that make Soludo do a better job Anambra?
These are the things that will be considered. We will look at it and the party will take a decision. Right. So, so what's next for the PDP then, sort of beyond an state? Well, you know, we just did our convention, the national convention mm. on 30th and 31st of October. And we have a new leadership coming up. Uh, we're sworn in on the 9th of December. And it's, uh, it's also a very capable uh, team that we've put together uh, for the party. And I do believe that um, they were able to work very hard to see PDP come back to power in 2023. And our Nigerians are anxiously waiting for the People's Democratic Party. And I can assure you, we will do everything possible within the rules of democracy to get PDP back in government. Okay. They know how to govern. Right. That's what you say. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we've done before. Right. For 16 years. But then the people voted you out. Well, but ne never mind. Uh, the people have the right to. Yes. We're out of time anyway. <laughs> Senator Ben Obi, thank you very much indeed. Always a pleasure to see you.